Hi, everyone. It's me, Chuck Parson, your co-host. Thank you for listening to The Life After. I'm very excited to introduce today's guest, Jennifer Knapp. If you grew up in evangelical circles, she probably doesn't need much of an introduction. But for everyone else, Jennifer Knapp was a very popular Christian musician in the late 90s and early 2000s, a Dove Award winner and Grammy nominee. In 2010, after a long hiatus from the music scene, she shook up the contemporary Christian music world by coming out publicly as gay just before the release of her album Letting Go. At the time, the concept of a gay Christian was practically an oxymoron in the American evangelical world. It was big news, even in the secular realm. I remember when it happened. I remember so many people around me weighing into the conversation, standing with her in support or lashing out in rebuke. Her coming out came at a pivotal time in the church culture narrative and was part of a systematic shift in the evangelical community's dialogue surrounding sexuality. Today, she runs a nonprofit called Inside Out Faith, focused on confronting non affirming churches and exposing them to the reality of the queer community in order to start new conversations and encourage inclusivity. She has a memoir available called Facing the Music My Story and is promoting her newest album, Love Comes Around, which can be found on Spotify, Apple Music, and wherever you stream your music. For more information, you can visit her website, jennifernapp.org, Nap spelled K N A P P. Without any further ado, this is our interview with Jennifer Knapp. Oh, you're fine. Hi, this is Brady Hart from The Life After, and I'm here with... Chuck Parson, also from The Life After. Hello. And uh, from Hazelwood, Missouri. We have a special guest today. Um, every week is a special guest, but today is like an even more special guest because her name is on a couple of CDs that I had when I was a kid. Yes. Uh, <laughs> welcome, uh, Jennifer Knapp, all the way from uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Well, glad to be here, gentlemen. Uh, so Maybe you are gentlemen. I don't really know, but we're, not we're, really. Mm, mm, mm. Mm. It's border, mm. border. Let's mm. jump right into it. Why did you come out? <laughs> I, was, I was doing a Larry. I was doing a Larry King. Let's uh, let's jump right into it. Uh, let's jump right into it. <laughs> I, I love that question. Why did I come out? As if like there was something that like magically happened one day. Um, you <laughs> yeah. Know, I, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I think there are two ways to approach that question. Which I, I just, I love those two points to kind of to make a notice of. Like, there's the fact that you know I'm in a same sex relationship with the with my now wife, and you know that's just the life that I have and the person that I fell in love with and it turns out people call that lesbian and gay and a whole other thing on the sexual yes, orientation yeah. spectrum so i don't know that that you know it wasn't like there was some magical switch that flipped on that day so i think that's a point right just normal life sure. and then i think there's the other side of it which is more of the why did you decide to do a press release about your sexual <laughs> right, orientation right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and you know and that's that's a rather public you know that's a really public move because um, to be honest, like I, I actually had to debate that um, when I started to kind of come back and do music. Part of me just didn't even really kind of want to. It's not that I didn't want to acknowledge it because I lived my life out in the open. I'd been with my partner for five years or so by the time I was back and doing music again. Um, and everyone that was around me knew that. Like I just didn't mm. live my life in secret. Like my it just seems strange. Right. But to this other element of that came up when I started to, to work again and particularly in Nashville and particularly with my history with the Christian music base, mm -hmm. um, Christian music audience, there were people that were specifically asking as a measure of whether or not they were going to be, you know, how engaged they were going to be with oh, my wow. music, right. yeah. Yeah. how engaged mm -hmm. they were going to be, whether or not they, you know, bought my records or put them in stores or, you know, myriad of reasons. And, and so part of it was just feeling like just in terms of, you know, being up front, I like by not saying something I felt like, you know, I was uh, I didn't want to like pull any. I, I wanted people to actually make it like in retrospect, what I will say is what I wanted people to do is be responsible for whatever decision they were going to make. If they were going to oh, make yeah. a basis. Yeah. You know, and this is revisionist history a bit, right? Uh, sure. But I, you weren't like it, perfectly thinking all of this when you did it, but <laughs> no, in hindsight, like it it's like yeah, but it wasn't integrity issue for me. Like sure. I, I didn't. Oh, I, yeah, we're like, with that. 
if I didn't say anything and I was gay, there was already a track record and a long history of people behind me that would have assumed that I didn't come out, quote unquote, because I was hiding something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just met way too many people traveling on the road. I knew the cost of that so much for other people that I just like was like, no, that's not going to happen on my watch. And and somewhere in there, just I didn't I wasn't personally comfortable with anyone getting any false impression from me sure. that I was trying to hide or hoodwink or be something other than I was. Because like at, at the end of the day, like the long history of what I do as an artist is based on being able to put a little something of myself on the table hmm. and, you know, being honest and, and talking about what my life and this was now a factor of my life that I was putting onto the table. So right. you know, that, that was part of the decision to like do the press release part of it but the other side of it i think about coming out is a little bit weird you know i came out the second yeah. that i fell in love in that kind mm -hmm, of way you mm -hmm. know what i mean and sure. it's beautiful it's another it's it to me it wasn't really a declaration in in real life and in real time but for the things that i've had to do as far as public life it's another kind of conversation so i kind so of I, relate with that because i i came out and i didn't do a press release but i came out on facebook you know you know that was kind of that's like a my, that's my a press version release. of it yeah, definitely. Like, oh and yeah. i was around so me, brady and i hadn't started the show yet and we hadn't really we were old friends but we hadn't reconnected yet and i jumped on that thread and man the shit people said on there was just, <laughs> it was bad it was, it was so, so bad, bad. Yeah, you know it's really crazy and if the, the funny thing is is it's it's also like the point to like one of the points in there is that, you know, everyone assumes that you're heteronormative mm -hmm. until you make a statement otherwise. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that's, you know, I think that the temperature of that's changing a little bit, you know, now, you know, it's not uncommon. Now somebody will say, well, when my kids grow up and whoever they fall in love with, you hear that a little bit more, I think, than I certainly did when I was growing up because, you know, me falling in love with a woman, I think, you know, like one of the factors for me being such a late bloomer, as I like to call myself, uh -huh. was just it, it It wasn't an option for me. And it it wasn't an either like a bad option or a good option. I just didn't comprehend that this was a possibility. It just the only thing I'd ever seen was, oh, well, and particularly in, a, in the Christian background was that, you know, I was supposed to somehow, even though I couldn't comprehend it, become this married, submissive to my husband, oh, wife, yeah. right. with two children, give up my career and, and stay at home and teach my kids about, um, evol or, you know, about dinosaurs creation. being fake. <laughs> You know? <laughs> you know, it's not like I want to, you know, I, I don't say that like I knock it because I think there are people that that narrative, I, I want to acknowledge that that narrative is really important for, for some people. But for mm -hmm. me, that narrative was so catastrophically not wrong right, <laughs> right, right, right. And, and uh antithetical <laughs> to something in my being and in my person that to try and kind of comprehend that I just, I couldn't, it just, it just seemed unimaginable. And so, you know, like the story I tell is like I was celibate for like 10 years sure. after I became a Christian. And the joke I make is it's 10 years I won't get back. Mm -hmm. um, right. That, that's one of <laughs> yep. my problems is I was really <laughs> sexy in my early 20s, damn it. I know. Right. It's all and, gone, right? <laughs> right. Uh, you know. <laughs> <Old Madden. laughs> I could have played the field. What? Right. So um, talk a little bit about about. Uh, I mean, exa literally exactly what we're talking about, being a late bloomer, because that's something that's like super, super, like a really common frustration for our listeners, yeah. for me and Brady personally. Yeah. Like I, so I got married at 22 and shouldn't have been married at 22. And, you know, it was a, I was a virgin through that, through, up, up until that point. And my sexuality was just sort of like went down the tubes for, you know, that whole period of my life so what was it what was it like to come out in your 20s <laughs> well you know I, I kind of like what you're saying I think by the by the time that I was capable of like by the I, I think what I, I like I was like probably 27 28 and at that time too I'd also made some life decisions you know I'd like walked away from CCM I kind of walked away from this womb of Christianity, this bubble of Christianity kind of trying to 
to fit into it and going, no, listen, I, I need to figure out what my own voice is. And, and at that point I, I feel like I was both like broken enough by it that, and desperate enough to have to like need to know my own voice. I think that was mm. part of it. And I think I was old enough, right? Like by the time I was 27, 28 and the theological issues that I had with the church were coming to a head. I mean, I felt like I was an adult. I felt like I was ready to bust out and say the things that I really wanted to think and deal with the things that I really want to deal with and take responsibility for all the things that, you know, as when I was younger and in my mid twenties, I, I just, I don't know that I had like the same kind of wisdom, the same kind of courage, this same kind of need, um, and, and strength to be able to kind of withstand. I think I'd been a student for a really long time and at a certain mm. point was ready to start, you know, not throwing my punches a little bit. So, mm. you know, I think in terms of sexuality, that's part of the narrative that I would that I kind of look back and go, yeah, like what was going on there? And I think that was part of it, you know, that to be a late bloomer, I just, like I said, like I was, I was sleeping with everyone and everything in my early years of college, which made me like a particularly good conquest for evangelical Christianity. I mean, I was saved mm -hmm. literally from a life of sin and, mm -hmm. you know, I, I shut the whole sex thing down, mm, but mm -hmm. I, and then went on 10 years of celibacy. And during that time, because of the high priority, particularly in the nineties with like the true love weights movement mm -hmm. and evangelical oh, Jesus, Christianity, yeah. right. Evangelical Christianity, putting such a price on virginity and not, no premarital sex. It kind of shuts down. Like for me, I think it shut down any opportunity to understand my own desire, to understand yeah. the response responsibility of what I do with my body, the understanding something of pleasure, mm -hmm. understanding that. And I, I think that accounts for me and being able to, you know, at least that's the narrative I would say, if I look back at my own kind of assessment, I would go, well, I don't think it was until I was 27 or 28 years old that I even, and, and I was out of that environment. Like I, I was out of that environment enough to say, listen, I have no idea who I am as a sexual person. Mm -hmm. So I need to go educate myself on what that is. And that means touching other people. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Oh <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> you know, but at the same time, I, you know, in fairness to the history that I've had inside of faith community, touching other people by the time I was 28 years old, I did understand of what it meant to not touch somebody with the right intent. I did understand something about what it means to value not only yourself and your own person, but the person across from you and not to just use my body or anybody else's body as some kind of disposable pleasure machine. Um, and, and that was my take. And that was a standard that was really important to me, but it didn't necessarily mean heteros heteronormativity, mm -hmm. um, getting married before I knew a person, you know, and I think these are some of the, the, mm -hmm a lot of the questions that even people who are still going to church every Sunday are starting to say, really, what is, what are we actually teaching here? And where do we actually learn what is good and what is bad? Or if you're a Christian, what is holy and what's not holy? If you never have the experience and you just rush right into it. I mean, I, there are a lot of people that I've talked to that got married in their early twenties and then, you know, have a family. And then by the time they're 30 years old and ready to, to move to the next stage of adulthood go, Oh my God, I just learned this on somebody else's dime. And I'm not even sure this is where I, the adult that I want to be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for some people that works out great. And for other people, it, it's not, it's devastating. And I certainly felt that crunch in my late twenties, but you know, I also, that was for me like an awakening to and an, an admission of that. I was a human being who really did want to connect with other people and, mm -hmm. and sex was obviously part of it. And mm -hmm. I needed to be in an environment where I wasn't going to be judged for that. I wasn't trying to break any laws or, or do any damage. I was actually finding that not having that conversation was damaging in and of itself. Sure. So when you made that decision to step away from CCM and kind of explore yourself and figure out who you are in your sexuality and figure out your late blooming, uh, what, what did you do? <laughs> like, what, I, I understand you moved. Is that correct? The narrative that I seemed to read was that, like, you were like, oh, man, I'm gay. I got to get out of here. <laughs> that seems like... <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I think that's an easy narrative. Like, I think a lot of people do read it that way. Sure, it it sure. certainly wasn't that way at the time. Okay. I mean, like for me, I, honestly, when I when I put up, I just remember vividly the day that I, I 
played my last show, like on the stage, I put my guitar in the guitar case and locked it shut. And I just, I see my hands doing it. Like it's a movie playing on my head. And Mm -hmm. that was a day Mm -hmm. where I was just like, I am locking this shit up and I'm packing up and I'm going somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I don't know who I am, what I am. I don't, Mm -hmm. you know, I felt like a failure in my career. I felt like a failure in my Uh faith. I felt, you know, I definitely was starting to think about who I was as a human being and I was lonely and I wanted to make connections with other people and I didn't know how to do it. So, you know, I, I started traveling and by 2000, I started traveling in Europe with, with, with a woman who had become my wife. Um, we've been together for, you know, that's like 15 years now, but cool. yeah, I, like, I think like the analogy that I put to it a lot is sort of like growing up when you're a kid, there's a certain point where you have to get out of the nest and you, you have to get away from your, it's not like you have necessarily we have bad parents or, you know, a bad mom and dad, but there are things that we don't do when mom and dad are watching us to, to kind of learn, um, what life is about. And, and, and even like moving towns, like I'm from a small town, like there's just something about the way when we grow up the whole time, everybody thinks you're, Oh, you're little Jenny, you know, growing up. And I'm not, I'm 40 year old. I've got needs. I've got shit I need to get done. And I can't worry about whether or not you're going to punish me or not anymore. Like you're not my Mm. parent anymore. Mm. I'm a full grown autonomous adult. And those are, I just think, you know, for me, the the key to that, I think was getting out of Nashville was traveling, Mm -hmm to and I, I that was that was like Europe actually was a an epiphany experience for me because I started to realize like oh not only is Christianity that I'm experiencing western Christianity the ex, the Christianity that I grew up in in the states was american Christianity it was like affected by american culture and european christians didn't necessarily practice christianity the same way that i'd experienced it and sure. And yet was, you know, there were people deeply meaningful about that. And then moving to Australia where that's less of an imperative for like the national population Mm -hmm. as, you know, as opposed to like, I grew up in Kansas and everyone at least says they believe in God (laughs) and Australians are like, why would you want it? Like every day I would run into uh, somebody in Australia and they would ask me, you know, where I came from and what I did. And when I told them my history with Christianity, they're like, why the hell would you do that? Hmm. And they would think I was a religious nut job. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. I'm I'm recovering. I don't know what I'm recovering (laughs) from or to, but trying to get people to understand something about that. I like Australians was the Australian culture was really amazing for me because a lot of people wouldn't, didn't assume what I, when I said I'm a Christian to somebody in Australia, they didn't necessarily assume what kind of Christian I was. They would ask me why on earth I would do that. And I didn't have answers early on. I really didn't have any answers for why I persisted. And Mm. it's taken me, you know, some 10 years later from that experience to go, man, those being outside of the nest, being outside of my home, being outside of the bubble, experiencing other, you know, getting outside of what I grew up in, deciding my adult self, I suppose, and knowing what I was going to keep and what part of that frame the person I am today was a really helpful experience. I was uh, similarly like I took a trip to uh, Europe the months before uh, probably actually probably weeks before I deconstructed. It wasn't I mean, I didn't live there. I didn't move. You know, I didn't like encounter the culture on like a, a daily level. But just I mean, I was sort of on the verge of deconstructing anyway. And I, I took this trip and I, I was immersed in a post-Christian culture. Um, and especially like in terms of evangelicalism or fundamentalism is like almost non-existent there. And I was like, this is so much more functional than the United States. Like it just really clicked for me. And that was one of the, that was one of the sort of last straws for me. Uh, so yeah, oh, go ahead. yeah no, I, I was just going to say, I, I, I appreciate that when we get an exposure to an experience of something different than what we've grown up with, it's a very liberating thing to see something that's on the menu of, of things that we can participate in that are actually, like I said, like for me, my sexual orientation all of a sudden became something that was a very liberating experience, not because I got to say, oh, wow, look, I get to like have sex with whoever I want. It wasn't like that at all. Like it, it was like, oh, this is a freedom of like moving 
you know, having like had like a, a stiff elbow or something that you can finally move back and forth and it mm. doesn't hurt you anymore. Like I have liberate, mm. I'm able to move in a natural, meaningful manner that mm. seems some way that I was constructed for that purpose. And I think even, even with my faith, you know, even though I'm, I wrestle with a lot of issues and I know that like every time I talk, anytime I might say, oh, well, I, I still participate in Christianity. Like, I don't even know what to say anymore because sure. it's so so not like the mechanism with which that I know that I was quote unquote raised with, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, I'm probably more deeply engaged and invested in this conversation than I've ever been in my whole life. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very hard to explain that I'm not just here to kind of being this, you know, this upward looking automaton that's, you know, just you know, a minion worshiping God and going, you know, the claw, it moves. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the claw. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's highly engaging and deeply moving. And it, it teaches me about, you know, connecting with other human beings and creativity and divinity, whatever that is. And, and Christ is, you know, the conversations about Jesus are a real test to some of those things. And I just don't want to take it for granted anymore. And I think that's part of my mm. investment in it. And I feel like and so many part, people, at the same sorry. time, you know, the discontent and the, the deconstruction, you're going, man, I'm not going to, it doesn't go back together that same way and it won't ever again. Right. Right. Mm. right yeah. I think so many people have um, a really hard time taking that first step out of, like evangelicalism or uh, fundamentalism for me, because I think there was, we were always taught that there's so much to be afraid of, to be scared of that. It needs to be, we really have to take the Bible serious. We have to take it literally. So kind of like that first step, did you encounter that when you went to Europe where maybe they were doing things a little bit different than you were used to or in Australia? And at first maybe you felt kind of, turned off by that or a little scared to participate or did you find yourself seeing that these people are genuine and wanting to just kind of jump in and participate in a way that they practice? Um, well in the guitar latching day, like I really Mm. thought I put the Tempest back in the box. I mean, when, when I walked in, when I walked out and my, when I took my first, I know I'm flight out of Nashville in which I knew that I was not coming back. Um, like I was like good riddance to bad rubbish. I mean, the first move that I made mm. made was, I mean, I guess in that context, like I had a context of which I could make sense of like the, you know, people said, well, if you give into your sexual orientation, you can no longer be a Christian. So you can't be gay and Christian. And I was sure. like, well, I'm definitely gay. So I just assumed that I wasn't a Christian anymore. And I was right. like, I washed my hands of it. I said, fuck it, then I'm out. Mm-hmm. Um, what I discovered as I traveled and like I would go to cathedrals, I'm a bit of a history history buff. I also was just like I was, you know, I also like got out of the the storm a little bit and had some time on my own. And I was just going, what just happened to me? Wow. <laughs> what happened to me over the last five or six years? How did I get so deep? Why am I like and but at the same time, it felt like such a fracture to walk away mm-hmm. and not because I was afraid of going to hell. I kind of, I'm kind of like, all right, well, let's see if that happens kind of person. (laughs) I like that. Yeah. I'm not afraid of, you know, I'm not a person who's afraid of a fight. Fortunately, that's just my personality. But at the same time, like I felt like a devastating loss Mm. and I have to go back and remember, like remind myself that that was terrifying to me because I'd lost when I, when I shut the door on that, I shut the door to just about everyone I knew. Mm-hmm. I shut the door because they, I knew they wouldn't talk to me anymore and they wouldn't talk to me in the same way unless mm-hmm. I was moving in the same direction that, that they were and saying, you know, uh, doing the same chant. Yeah, sure. I, I couldn't do the same chant anymore. And so, yeah, it was, it was terrifying But to be able to, I think what started to reignite me, and this is a very long seven year journey, is that I, even though I thought that I was shutting the door, turning out the lights, putting a padlock on it, saying I'm never opening that up again, what it took me a long time to acknowledge is there was something about that that was genuine to me in my experience. And to be able to see new cultures, to be able to see the history of a church, to be able to see the things that give me consternation and angry, you know, that made me angry to pull on a thread and go, what 
happened. Like Mm -hmm. I didn't have, I I really didn't have a concept as a Christian about European history, the, you know, the Western movement of Christianity. And I had some ideas about, you know, the Reformation, the Catholic split, but I didn't really know anything about the long-term history of the tradition as if the the tradition that I experienced today was the absolute refined, purest version of it. And it's not, never has been. And that's when I started to kind of like, just be curious about the history and even critical. Like I started out mad and pissed and I like, I want everything that I read was with hell bent to try and to shed a light on it and break it and call it all bullshit. Mm -hmm. But you know, seven or eight years on, I'm still deeply moved by what it means to be able to engage this conversation, to be able to think deeply about theology and, and not just think about it. It's, I I don't even want to say that it's just intellectual, but that I get, I get to see what happens when people walk into a room and genuinely listen to each other, Mm -hmm. give their gifts to one another, love and create. And, you know, as a Christian, if I were, you know, if I were going to talk about sacred text, I would go, oh, well, two or more are gathered. That's church. But I hate that language now. So I, it's not that I want to steal that away from God or from Christianity. I just don't think that we own it. Sure. And that's that's kind of the journey that sent me on. I realize I've talked a lot about that, but okay. um, it's kind of nowhere where you started. But yeah, it's it's these fits and starts of like just I completely set a bomb off and thought it didn't exist. And then after the dust settled, I started finding really curious pieces laying around and Mm -hmm. started to accumulate them and gather them up. And, you know, some things I didn't pick up and keep and other things. So I was like, man, that's, that's pretty special. I'm, I don't really know what I'm going to do with that, but I'm not necessarily throwing it away either. And that's, I Mm. kind of, you know, it's 10 years later and I'm I'm still kind of on that journey. What's interesting is that you are able to sort of, uh, the difference is that that you're deciding what you take away from it versus being told if you don't fit this, this puzzle piece, you know that then you don't you don't belong right hmm. i mean that's a big difference um we're gonna take a quick break um more with uh jennifer knapp when we get back got some got some more questions you got more questions Brady? Well, yeah i do we'll be right back after this there are estimated to be over six hundred thirty thousand podcasts in the world today many of these podcast hosts producers writers and engineers go unpaid for their work putting in long hours at regular people jobs in order to make ends meet. This is Bill Barnum, the host of Combine Talk with Bill Barnum. Well, you know, we mostly cover the fundamentals of combine machinery, anything from purchasing to maintenance or repair. Each week, we feature a verbal description of our pimped out combine of the week. You know, with sweet flames or American flags or eagles or something. We have a devout audience of about 300. It's more of a community, really. But in order to keep up with the bills around the house, I have to put in 25 to 30 hours a week at the local Piggly Wiggly. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm grateful for what I have, but I'd really like to focus on my passion someday. Most podcast hosts rely on Patreon accounts for income strained to generate special content to keep up with the demands of their contributing listeners. This is Megan, with an E, a Y, and an H, host of Appropriated Nails on Fleek. So like, I work so hard, like every day, scrolling through my IG for like hours, finding the best hashtag nail art, hashtag nail art ooh la la, hashtag nail art wow, hashtag nail art swag. I have to search like 20 different hashtags, okay? Now I'm saying to get my listeners the content they deserve. And I'm still asking my dad for money like twice a week, okay? And I'm saying... I'm Brady Harden, co-host of The Life After, and I'm here to tell you that for just one or two dollars a month, you can help join the fight against regular people jobs and make it easier for us, your host, to bring you even more of the quality content you love so much. For more information, visit patreon.com slash the life after. That's patreon.com slash the life after and subscribe to donate as little as one or two dollars a month. Make a podcast host dreams come true because we all need a little second Saturday in our lives. 
Um, welcome back to the life after. Uh, I'm Chuck Parson. <laughs> Brady Hardy. And Jennifer Knapp. Uh, you know, a second ago when you were talking about your deconstruction, I, I like how you said that you kind of blew up a bomb and then you figured out the things that you wanted to get rid of or not. It reminded me of like a yard sale uh, that for me, for faith, there's so many things I just wanted to get rid of all at once. And then you put them out in the yard and people start looking at them and start picking them apart. And you're like, wait, actually, I want to keep that. Yeah, don't, you start, you feel the panic. You're like, right. Yeah. And, oh, that's really interesting. And yeah. so for me, it was kind of like um, a hoarder's situation for a while. And then I needed to start kind of letting things go. And then they all just kind of personally went, you know. Uh, but another thing you're saying, Jennifer, that really hit me was um, I was thinking of Joseph Campbell, of how he talks about the monomyth and studying religions that even though I don't believe the Bible, like I used to, some of those stories are still important to me mm -hmm. and I can look at them as a metaphor for who we are, our humanity. And it's able to kind of compel me into a more, I don't know, like a more engaged situation when it comes to loving people or sacrificing myself. Um, as long as I keep it in with my personal wisdom and intuition that I know boundaries and I keep myself. And cause that was something I was really lacking big time when I was evangelical. Um, I'm dying I, to step in and comment right now. Do go it. for my, it. Please do it. Do it. With my theological studies kind of thing. Right. Yes. This is, like there, there are two things that I love, like, cause it, they kind of where you're talking about that, that, that deeply, but I'm totally into. And first off, I love jo Joseph Campbell. Mm. I, I think he has a real understanding of the value of what it means when we find our mythologies and find the stories that deeply represent us. And the, I, and I, I would, I would, I don't have a quote necessarily, but from what I gather from Joseph Campbell and the, the interviews that I read from him, one of the things that I walk away with from him is that we, you know, what mythology allows us to do is actually give us a construct with which our deeply moving, universally true truth, whatever that is with a tiny T, has a voice and has a construct that makes it tangible to us so that we can see it, share it, and engage it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that his oh, critique like that. is that when we get so wrapped up in believing that that myth is a belief, it actually turns on itself mm. and it becomes a construct that actually limits us rather than unleashes us into mm. what mythology did for us in the first place. Right. So I'll mention Joseph Campbell in that regard, and then I'll move over to Harvey Cox, who wrote, he's a, he's a theologian who wrote a, a lovely book called The Future of Faith. And he's a, it's from a, you know, a theological perspective. And Harvey Cox's concern was this exchange that we've actually had and what, you know, we might say I, I most Christians are particularly fundamental and conservative Christians on the far right will be saying, I'm a Christian because I believe in and you say, you know, like the, the original sin and the creation narrative and that Noah was on the ark and that Abraham put Isaac, you know, offered Isaac up for sacrifice and Jesus was resurrected on the third day and born, you know, go down the list of the beliefs and the things you would write down in paper as as facts that you have to sign off on without doubt and with full conviction in order to say, I am a Christian. And so you marry what Harvey Cox was saying, that we've exchanged faith with belief and that we're no longer participating mm. in religion with the same kind of um, – Finding that finding that connection to the divine, uh, we're making the rules and practicing the rules and the rituals and the rites without ever actually having engaged or having having listened. And Harvey would Harvey's making the I think Harvey makes the argument in his book The Future of Faith that we actually move back to a movement of the spirit. And that's that's a rather Christian conversation. So I don't want to like get you guys off topic and not necessarily getting into the church. But when I marry, what happens when I married Joseph and Cox is that and the, the songwriter and the part of me who as a living tells a story right and connects people mm -hmm. like i can tell you my story and it doesn't even have to be true for you to understand something that connects to you sure. yeah. uh you know harper lee and to kill a mockingbird gave me just as much permission to be a gay woman as the indigo girls did yes in cool. their real life yeah. and they're all real truthful stories and i think that's what joseph campbell would say and i think that's what harvey cox says 
limits us. We start your... thinking that spirituality is just Christianity and its set of belief and its doctrines and dogmas. Let me I'm ask done. you this, Jennifer, though. I'm, I'm curious that from one gay person to another. When it comes, though, to looking at the Old Testament, I have such a hard time respecting much of Christianity because I'm thinking that what we learned about God comes from the Old Testament. Like we, we learned about it from, from the Bible, but then there's parts in the Old Testament where he like called for people like us to be killed, you know? And so it's hard for me to kind of like even want to go back to that metaphor because there is such a personal, you know, kind of like a, a personal stab towards who I am as a person that makes me kind of want to reject that altogether. Help, help me out. Help me understand where you're coming from. And uh, <laughs> well, therapize me, saying... Jennifer Knapp, therapize me. <laughs> well, first, I would say that I would she qualify and that. say that I'm not a biblical scholar um, yeah. at all. But, uh, you know, my one of the things and I'll so I'll speak from a personal space of what in some way has rescued the Bible for me. Okay. Given like the same issues that you've mentioned and and then some, right? Um, is that one is this idea that it was ever meant to teach Christianity the way that we teach it today? Mm-hmm. I mean, okay. the in the same. I don't know, and I don't. I don't want to go back in history and say this is what the person who wrote this was intending to do because I didn't live in that time, and I don't know what the rules and the way people communicated with writing in the same way, which is all to say is that like, I don't know, I don't think it's, I don't necessarily agree that that's the intention of anybody writing those words at that time was to create a narrative that was anti-sexual you know, anti, you know, anti LGBTQ, like it, it had no compre the person had no comprehension of that who was writing it. I imagine there were social mores in the time that were standards of the time in the same way that we have strange anomalies now, like the true love weights movement. Mm -hmm. That's, Mm -hmm. which is totally different than the same social mores that you see in the old Testament. We, we kind of have these, these mores that change throughout time and these traditions that we do. And I think we see in the writing and what was taught at that time in that time and space, but I'm not necessarily convinced that the person at the time would have taught those same kind of principles or foundational issues with the same degree of attention and detail that we give them today by parsing them out. Mm, okay. You know, it's quite possible that somebody would have rolled right over them. It's quite possible. Yeah. Like some, yeah, I, I just have a hard time. You know, I'm sure that there were people that were gay and that were, you know, found, you know, two men lying with each other or two women. And at some point somebody got pissed and took them out back and did a dreadfully awful thing and ended their lives. Um, that still happens today, but I don't think it's necessarily couched in this religious thing. I, I just don't. I don't tie it to that way. I think the way that some people would like to teach it. I think it's a really bold excuse to go back in time and say, this is what somebody meant. And we don't know what they meant. Um, at the same time, I would go, wow, like there's a lot of misogyny and yeah. a lot of terror that are, you know, rape is okay. Apparently, you know, the rape of women is apparently okay mm-hmm. because it exists and a blessing comes out of one or two morals of the story in old Testament. I'm, I'm not okay with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and if somebody wrote that and put attempted to put, you know, somebody wrote that same story today and attempted to put it into a canon, I would argue it and I would probably destroy the letter. But, you know, somebody might keep that around and decide to put it in a book 100 years from now. And that's mm. what we're dealing with. It so makes sense. I, I understand. You know, that's a long answer. I I just, for me, I don't get a lot of value. I mean, I think there is a theological argument to be made at those points. But I also think one of the points that we need to make is understanding what the Bible is, what, what, when it was written, why it was written in the context of which Mm -hmm. we cannot say that we knew in the context of which we decide to read it now. I think we have to be brutally honest about what that is. Um, And so, yeah, there's, you know, another, one other thing I'll I'll mention too, because I, I like bird books. Um, Jay, there's a, a, a rabbi by the name of Jay Michelson wrote a book called God versus gay. And he actually talks about Leviticus very specifically from a, a rabbinical. So the Jewish text, which is what it is, mm-hmm. um, 
and, and from that point of view and make some really good arguments about it. So from that context, if you're looking at like, what do we do in terms of like, what is right religious practice as a rabbi? I, I believe I'm, I'm remembering this correctly, that Jay Michelson was talking about how if, you know, if you want to be a priest, then same sex relationships is not on for you. Like it, it is a part of a purification ritual to do or not do to do. And it's not a matter of somebody's degenerate nature in and of themselves. It's just an, an act that you decide to choose um, to do or to not do like priests are married or not married or some kind of choice that you might make along that way. Um, and they're, you know, eating shellfish or not eating shellfish. These are right. These are things that you decide to do as a rite of, of purification as a priest or for a particular role. So when one's not in that role, you know, or if one decides to take that on, those are, you know, those are, I think a little bit more legitimate questions, but there were not issues. I don't, I would argue that we're not necessarily there to, 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 to legislate a participation in the community, but rather trying to understand something about, um, as well, like what that group of Israel meant to those people at that time. Mm. So it's, it's complicated. And I think and for me, the, and clearly my, my lack of, uh, concise scholarship on this that, that is lacking, um, shows the complexity that this, when it gets just whittled down to, you know, you can't be gay and that God doesn't love you and that your abomination is an extremely ignorant and short-sighted quotation of a sacred text that a lot of people use. And if you're going to use it, I think you should study it and be, you know, and know the weapon that you're choosing to wield. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a Hippocratic oath. It's a loaded weapon and like whatever way you want to look at it, um, to just simply go out and pull a text and not understand its legacy, its, you know, its history, its legacy and what, you know, what to do it with today, I think is problematic. So hmm. that's yeah. my short spiel. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> uh, so Jen, in your, uh, I, I, I watched your Ted talk, which is probably what a few years old now. Um, but you said, uh, you said you can't write a, a, a gay love song. And I kind of, I really liked that. And you, you sort of expounded on your, your, your concept of, of love and what it means. And, and I, I feel like when we're talking about being post-Christian or being, you know, sort of like a, a, a more liberated, not fundamentalist Christian, um, the implications of love are, you sort of have to reinvent it and redefine it for yourself um, you know, for a lot of Christians, like love it, being loving means telling you that you, sh that you can't be gay. <laughs> right. You know, yeah. Telling so, you things you don't want to hear. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. The, the tough love, the, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so uh, tell me about, tell me about why you can't write a gay love song. <laughs> well, I suppose you can. Um, but I, I, I think the point, the point to be made there is that I don't, you know, when I, when I write a love song, I'm, uh, to at least to date, I have not written a song about gay sex. It's kind of what I mean. Um, uh -huh. and I haven't, I haven't, I, I don't personally, I may write a song, a, a love song about, and in my mind, picture my lover or my partner, or my wife, um, those all happen to be the same thing, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. that was funny. <laughs> my wife, um, <laughs> Sorry, my, uh, yeah. but, if you were I, a rapper, I might think they were different, but <laughs> you're a singer songwriter. So. But, but when I, when I talk about love, I should, I think that should look the same way when I move my focus to someone else, um, mm -hmm. who's not an intimate, um, that the nuances of how I've learned to love my partner, I've learned from other people loving me back, um, without sex, without desire and, with it. And I don't know, I just don't think it stops and ends with one person. So when I, when I think about love and what it means to do that at its I don't know, lack of vocabulary at this hour, uh, I would say like, it's the most purest form, like whatever that means mm -hmm. that I'm not, I, I'm not aching to find something that's just on the soup, on the superficial kind of surface. I mean, reaching deep down into the places that that are just, I don't know, like beyond words and are connected to somebody else. And to, to, to me that like, that is not a place that has gender attached to it. It doesn't have, um, necessarily, you know, sex acts associated with it. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like the same principles that, you know, there I've all named three songs that I can think of 
off the bat, there's a song called Mr. Gray, um, which is about my grandfather and like the history of the way I've learned love is there's a lifetime in that three, three and a half minutes. And he's the focal point and the talking point, which gets me reminiscing about where and how I learned love. And that shows up in that song about somebody who's my grandfather. And then I have another song in Neo show that's a little, it sounds sad, but it's, it's the same thing. It's talking about where I grew up and the relationship that I had with my dad and what I think of him and how perhaps he sees himself and the love that's tied up in that. And mm -hmm. then you go all the way to another song called like want for nothing. And it's, it's, it's the picture in my mind when I see that is, you know, literally that my lover laying in bed and, and thinking and wanting the whole world to be peaceful and kind and generous and graceful for that person. And what do I have to do to be there and to be a part of it mm. to me that that's a seamless line between those all through all of those things. And if, if I'm not tapping into that personally, I, I don't think I'm a trustworthy the human being to to listen to when I start talking about love. Mm -hmm. I think love brings us together. Love, like you guys talked about, you know that 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 Christian concept of you know, I'm I'm doing this because I love you. I'm cutting you out because I love you. I'm saying I'm telling you that you're going to hell because I love you. The separation kind of things and concepts to me is not for as is a really great way of saying that's not what love is. I mean, to me, love is always bringing someone in coming closer, um, being with, um, com communing with being next to in and around. So that, that mm -hmm. is not a gay principle to me and gays don't own it and heterosexuals don't own it. And it's just kind of why I still toy around with the divine because I'm, I'm not sure that we can own it as much as just make it bigger and contribute to it mm -hmm. and participate in it. And yeah. Cool. I would say the gays, we own it in one way. Like, mm, I own it. I did a big snap. Just so everybody, everybody <laughs> listening knows. So, uh, so Jen, tell us about, uh, tell us about well, Inside Out Faith. First, is it Jennifer or Jen? Which one are we? Which Derek one are we says going by? Jen. So I just adopted it. I don't know if that's okay though. Oh, Jennifer, we I are just... so sorry. Which one should we use? <laughs> I'll let you get away with it this time. No. Oh. I'm... Okay. I mean, on paper, yes, it's Jennifer, Jennifer, and usually there's a rapport, but I can tell you're very comfortable, so it's all good. Oh, okay. thank God. Je Jennifer. Now I feel like I need to say Jennifer for the rest of it you out of should. respect. You should. You should feel bad. <laughs> Jennifer. I'll just watch you be self-conscious about it and laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds right. That's good. Uh, so tell us about Inside Out Faith. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't need to. Yeah, you tell us about it. I'd rather hear it from her than you. Right. right. So, well, Inside Out Faith. And so at, so for a website, uh, just to see what we're up to is insideoutfaith.org. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a nonprofit organization that I started. And probably like the, the short version of it is that it's it's LGBTQ affirmation and in and faith. So you know I'm kind of diving into faith communities and talking about affirming LGBTQ voices. Um, you know we're uh, I I say advocate versus activist. Um, mostly I'm just concerned about getting the real story about LGBTQ people and how we've engaged this issue inside of our faith communities. Um, some people are still there um, fighting hard. Um, living their life and their Southern Baptist gays that are going to church every Sunday and love it and wouldn't exchange it for the world and other people have left. But mostly I'm just telling that, you know, I want to be a part of being able to sh share that story, engage the deep issues about that and, and show that this is not just some random mystery thing to overcome that it's like people actually have lives and mm. they Sorting these these questions out are is you know being able to get back to the church for some people is a kind of liberation and for other people and I, I can't say this enough like I'm not you know inside out faith isn't content with trying to direct people toward Christianity um, but you know directing people to a liberated experience and encounter in faith and in and around that intersection so for some people that means diving in deeper um, to their their faith and their specific denominations or traditions. 
situations. And for other people, that's helping them find a way out and survivability. Um, mm. It's not trying to lay the script, but talking about the life and showing what that story has been like. And and for me, that's that's been a vital part. You know, when I came out in 2010, I really, I really actually was very eager to never be having to go inside of a church again. Like I was really excited. Mm. I thought, oh, now that I'm gay, I don't have to talk to Christians anymore. I can just go do whatever I'm going to go do. And it's, it didn't really turn out that way. It turns out I've got a lot to say, and there's been an impact that this, you know, obviously that Christianity has, has had something to say to me, whether or not I've wanted to listen to it. Um, it's, you know, it's come into my life based on the premise that it deserves to say something because of my sexual orientation. And for me, it's part of it is just standing up going, no, you, you don't get to do that. But if we're going to talk about what Christianity and LGBTQ issues are, then we're going to talk about it in up front. We're going to take responsibility for what we say. And, you know, for those who are still contesting and throwing LGBTQ people out of their churches, I'll say, no, here, you know, I, I want to introduce them to the real stories and the, the people that are living this out and hopefully provide some resources and some stories that will help us along wow. the way. Either, you know, make, like you said, um, Chuck, to be able to make the decisions and not just be a leaf in the wind. Um, I think those days mm -hmm. are over. Yeah. And I think yeah. the more we share those stories is, is part of, you know, taking back the right to our own sense of being and worth. Sure. The, the people I always look up to are the ones who go through something that's difficult, that doesn't make sense. And once they kind of figure themselves out, they go back to where they came from with this, yeah, I sound like Joseph Campbell, but they're going back to the world that they were familiar with, with this new knowledge that they're able to share to other people. The elixir. And, the elixir. And that's what I see <laughs> you doing with Inside Out is um, you weren't just part of evangelicalism. You were kind of like a, a poster woman. Is that the is that the right term? Poster, poster girl. woman. Poster, poster girl. Anyway. I prefer so pinup, but hey, whatever. Poster hey person. Oh, now it's just yeah, there we go. Yeah, right. no, I like that one better. It's good. <laughs> but, I, but I love that you no, I, now you're going back part... to those places and like trying to give healing to those that didn't have that before. I think that's amazing. Well, you know, and I, I think that kind of goes back to this thing where it's like oftentimes I get accused of, you know, doing, being the first gay Christian, right. To come out mm -hmm. the Chris, first gay right. Christian musician to come out. Right. And one, that's not true. Gay um, bolts. Yeah. Like, right. The Ray <laughs> bolts, um, uh, Marsha, uh, there, there, and there, uh, there's a couple of other notable people that, you know, if you d dig deep enough in Wikipedia, right. there's yeah. a storyline there. That, that many people have gone before me, sure. yeah. and more than that, there are the nameless, the people who didn't, yes, right, you know, the the people who have gone their entire lives with having never spoken about this on a public thing because they couldn't, sure. because they still can't, and because it's it's a serious. It's it's not mucking around. I mean, these people's hmm. lives will can or are they're afraid of ruin having their lives ruined right. because of this, um, you know. And uh, you know, if there's anything that like that I did, you know, out of this, it's a mile marker of any time. It's just saying, listen, yeah, this is happening. This wow. is you know, I will talk about this in public. Mm -hmm. I will continue to engage, and I will push against this idea that you get to rewrite my whole history and write me off and erase me or any yes. of my temporaries or any of my friends mm. or any of my people of faith or any straight people who stand behind me, people who are inside the church or outside of the church. It is not up to a conservative view to write the narrative of what a faith tradition is. Absolutely. And I am willing to talk about that. And that is a luxury that I have because I'm no longer beholden to that industry. Mm -hmm. um, it has cost me, but yep. at the same time, I, I don't know what, a, you know, I don't know what other conversation to have. It is, it is a, like some days it feels, you know, I don't know that I've, I've ne necessarily done anything that, but said, listen, I'm going to go live my life. And I was really happy to, to not be asked to say anything else. But I keep getting asked, and I think that's part of – I think that's an honor and a privilege for the space to be happening in the – in particularly in our American faith culture and a Christian culture particularly of people saying, what has this been like? 
Tell us what the theological issues have been for you. Tell us what we can do better. Tell us where to go. And I think that's an important thing to respond to. And that was, in a lot of ways, a second choice I felt like I had to make, you know, was did I make the choice of sharing something about my personal life and letting, you know, and letting people in on that and sharing that? And the second choice was after people knew that, was I going to respond when people said that they heard me, that they listened to me and they wanted me, they wanted to know more about the experience that I'd had. Um, you know, I took mm-hmm. that not only personally, but I realized that I have the privilege of being able to say that in such a way that brings light to the thousands and thousands of other people who've had a very similar journey. Um, and, you know, my name might be put on it for a little while, but my goal at Inside Out Faith is to to have that be the last thought on your mind is, you know, Jennifer Knapp, gay Christian, but to just start going, oh, gay Christians, yeah, they exist. Here's some amazing people that you may not have ever heard of. die tonight do you know where stop you... just tell them about our website oh just tell them to go to the lifeafter.org yes they can go now even without accepting jesus christ as their personal lord and savior <laughs> the lifeafter.org we have a blog contact page a link to our facebook page and more all right the lifeafter.org heavenly we so uh, in our community we experience a lot of skepticism surrounding, um, you know, whether or not church culture is capable of of like changing. Because like okay, so we have we have fundamentalism, which is like the the flaws in that system are really obvious. You have, but then you have like sort of like more progressive church communities where they like or either sort of don't address it or they, but they don't really champion it. And you end up in this like in between space that's really kind of unhelpful. Um, wh- how do you? I don't even know how to ask this question. <laughs> how do how do you keep going when it seems so overwhelmingly like, you know, like the like the church is like unmovable in a lot of ways. Well, what? Uh, yeah, I mean, there there are certainly days where I think this is so impossible. Why am I still having this conversation? Like sure. just, you know, I, why yeah, have I feel a, the same way. <laughs> yeah. Why have a circular? Yeah. It, it's, it feels really frustrating some days when you're just like, Oh, this is, you don't want to call it dumb because it's obviously deeply meaningful, important, but you just feel like yeah. you're not going to move this rock anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think part of what helps me kind of get up after a bad day or just a day where I'm exhausted and kind of don't care is, is one on those days to like actually give myself permission to say, you know, I'm just a normal human being Mm -hmm. and life is, you know, I don't, there's nothing in this house or in this room or in this space that I have to solve or fix or correct or defend myself against. I think Mm -hmm. it's important to kind of have those days where you just kind of unplug from the news and the social justice part of it and just be a normal human being, like Mm -hmm. live with what you can see that's in front of your face. I think it's important. Um, and then I, you know, and then I hear the rest of my world knocking on on my door, going, "You can't forget about us." <laughs> um, but after you recover, I think the other the other one of the other things that I think about is that I, I kind of it's not that I have not given it's not that I've given up on changing people's theology, but what I will say is that you know I have the you know I have an understanding of like particularly of Christian history to a certain point that there are people who have won theological debates that get written down in history and things that we carry on. And there are other theologies that didn't win, that don't get the press, that don't get written down and they still exist. Mm -hmm. I mean, neo-Nazis still exist. They're just not in the numbers. I, I don't, that's all to say is that I don't think, you know, once we lay hold of an idea, no matter how good or bad it is, I'm not sure that you can put it back in the bag. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that for those people who are like actually sold out and teaching, you know, heteronormative creationism, um, I I don't know that 
uh, I'm not big enough. You know, I'm not big enough by myself. Sure. I'm not smart enough by myself. And I, I certainly don't think that you're going to change anyone's theology on that. It exists. There's a, a long history of that. Mm-hmm. But I think what we can't. So I. So that's all. That's all to say is that I'm. That's not my game. Like I'm not mm-hmm. out there to change that theology because it exists and it's it's a pretty hard thing to shatter. Mm. But what I can do is put a mirror up to it. I can choose something different. I can practice something different and participate in something different. Um, again, like those are achievable goals, like find the measures of which that I can. And this, and the other thing I'd say about that theology as well is that in, in, it, in that it exists, People aren't don't tend to move away from their theology and the way that they view the world and their epiphanies and things of that nature unless they've had an experience um, with it that allows them to move on to a new space. Um, you know, it's it's I, and I want you know in terms of like LGBTQ people, like if you've never met somebody who's gay and you say that you're a friend of LGBTQ people in the church, I'd. I don't know how you say that because you don't know anybody, you know, Mm -hmm. you don't. Yeah. And I'm not saying that to be mean, like you you and I have talked for a couple of, you know, we'll, we'll have talked for a couple of hours today, but it takes a lifetime for us to really get to know each other and to, Mm -hmm. you know, a long, you know, a little bit longer than a few minutes. And for me to say that I love you in a, in a, in a way that's actually long-term and and deeply meaningful. So I think theology is kind of the same way. You, you have to know and build relationships with that. And we build our experiences by going out and living it and you have to connect with other people. So that, that's part of it. You know, I, I just, I don't know that, you know, in the long term, just trying to bite off bite sized pe- pieces, know what my gifts are, know what I'm capable of doing and what I'm not capable of doing, which is, you know, thinking that the world's going to be perfect tomorrow. It's not. Mm. It's it's absolutely not. I'm terrible pessimist. I'm not a very good friend to be around some days uh-huh. because I will tell you, you know, it it gets better, you know, in that, in you know, the LGBTQ, it gets better because we get better at knowing who we are in ourselves. We get better at owning our own narrative and not letting other people outside of us write that narrative for us. Yeah. And I think that matters just as much inside of our faith traditions as it does outside of it. Well, a wise woman once said, it's difficult for prejudice to survive proximity. <laughs> I stole that from other people who said it before me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, but I, when I read that quote from you, I was like, damn, that is such a good point because, yeah. you know, uh, when I was brought up, we had this idea about gay people. And then I realized, you know, when I was like 14, I'm like, oh, fuck, I'm one of them, you know? Yeah. And then I, you know, had these prejudices even against myself. But I was like, no, I, I got to know myself and knew that I at that time was really seeking the Lord and wanting to do everything I could right and uh, realized that, no, this prejudice that even I had about myself was wrong. And so when I came out, um, I related to what you said about having that point of integrity. I just, I wanted to be myself 100% and not feel like I have to hide, um, if I'm in public or, or whatever, this is after my divorce, obviously. But, um, I wanted to be that face for people. I wanted to represent that to my old fundamentalist friends that whenever they do have these prejudices against homosexuals, now they have my face, that they have to look at Mm. and my son's face, not that my son is gay, he's six, but like knowing that when people make or they vote or they treat gay people poorly, it's not just going to be affecting some Joe Schmo that they've never met. It's going to affect Brady Harden, who they grew up with, and it's going to be affecting my family. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think that's kind of, what I want to do is be there for people and be that representation that, hey, we're not what we were taught, that the uh, story of homosexuals were, were, were different. And as you're doing of getting more of those stories out and, and telling those, letting people, like you said, own their narrative so they could tell those and, and people can see, hey, what we believe these prejudices cannot exist anymore because the evidence is right in front of us. And the evidence is a resounding no to what prejudice we were brought up to believe. Um, anyway, you said that I got so damn excited. <laughs> no, and, and that's the thing. Like, and I think that circles back around to like this, this, this thing I deeply believe like that, 
it's when we come together that we begin to experience things like love and grace. And I can say, you know, I can tell you all the things that I quote unquote believe, right. And I can spout them off and write them out, but I still have to go out and live it. And when, when I start living that on the back of somebody else or at the expense of somebody else, the, the days that, you know, you know, maybe, you know, maybe I want to say this, I don't know. Like I just, I, I've never in my, yeah, this isn't a dare and I'm not asking, inviting anyone to necessarily do this, but like the worst things that have ever been said to me have been said to be anonymously Mm. and from a distance and in writing and on, you know, message boards. Yeah. But those, and I know, and I, and some of those people, not anonymously, like some Mm -hmm. of those people that some of the worst things that have ever been said to me, and I know the person who said them and then, then they come and stand and look me in the eye. Can't say it. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, yep. there I see, you know, I've had a couple of pastors who have just railed against me and then shown up, at, you know, and I've read what they've written and I've seen what they've taught. And and then they come next to me and they're the ones that are shaking mm-hmm. when they look me in the eye and I shake their hand and I say, I love you, man. Why? Why are you, you know, why are you hurting me? Like, I'd like mm. you to meet 20 other people where what you're saying is hurting us. Damn, and then yeah. they shake and they walk away and mm. I'm like, mm-hmm. come, we'll be friends. Let's have a drink. Let's, let's talk about li- what life is. Let's not teach one. Let's not tell each other what, what's wrong about the other. Let's see what's loving. What can I love that's in you? And what can you love that's in me? Right. Um, you know, and I just, it's amazing to me how disarming that is and, um, and how, like I say, I, I feel like I've been very fortunate um, to to be able to say like like that's something that I've learned. I've I've seen more people who, who thought that they hated me when they walked in the room, and have met me when I embrace them and and genuinely try and like not hate them back. Mm-hmm. Um, and watch how that makes somebody's leg shake. I mean, it disarms me when people do that to me, when I'm on a tear, right. And I'm mad or I'm angry. I'm pissed. And somebody just looks me in the eye and goes, Hey, you're mad. What can I help you with? Yeah. (laughs) You know, how can I help you find peace at this moment? What do you, how can I help you? Mm -hmm. And, and, And I think that's, that's the part for me that's really engaging to me, particularly about LGBTQ and uh, affirmation in the church is we haven't, you know, we haven't had a long history, but now we're turning toward the church and saying, say that to my face, mm-hmm. say that to me, mm-hmm. take responsibility for what you're saying, say that to my mother, say that to my children, mm-hmm. say that to my family, say that to my community, say that to my city, my town, my state. And all of a sudden we start to realize, wow, what we are doing and saying and teaching, maybe we should, you know, I'll, I'll say at the end of the day, like maybe we should reconsider the cost of that. Um, I may not be able to get you to change it, but I will certainly invite you to places to, to show you what's happening. Mm-hmm. And I, I, to me, I think that's, that's half of the battle is finding these places where we get to see that and participate that in, in that. And that's, that's the real challenge. Um, and that's what gets me up, you know, whenever yeah. I decide to kind of engage this, that I will go into some really nasty places, um, to, to be able to just say, listen, you know, meet me. You can meet sure. me. You, not everybody has the fortitude to be able to walk into this room. But today I've got that fortitude. I prepared myself this day to walk into this room and meet you. And um, I hope that you will allow me to meet you as well. And something that's truthful mm. and honest. And I, I don't know. It, it, I feel a little bit Pollyanna when I say it and a little bit naive on some days. But <laughs> sure. I don't know how to get around it. You know, at the end of the day, there's there's nothing that connects people by, by, I mean, it works socially, looking somebody in the eye, standing in front of somebody, offering a hand, giving a hug, being there and putting your weapons down. It's, it's, yeah. it literally is disarming and connecting all at the same time. Yeah. Badass. That's great. That's amazing. I, I really, I really appreciate you saying that too, because like for me, like when I reflect on my own exodus from Christianity, when I reflect on my own, you know, when my views shifted on LGBT issues and, uh, you know, all the other like, you know, sort of cultural issues with, with fundamentalism, um, I realized that like, it wasn't like, I didn't sit down with somebody and they argued with me until my views didn't make sense and theirs did. But what did happen is I had a series of experiences, some of which were arguments, some of which were conversations, some of which were me finding myself in a culture that I was not familiar with, in a situation that I that I wasn't, you know, 
inherently, you know, adept to and, and walking away from it with a, with a, a tiny insecurity of like, maybe what I think is not correct. And then that insecurity outlasts your beliefs that don't make sense. You know, it, it keeps nagging you because it's always there because you have these experiences. Um, and that is what makes change down the line. Even if, you know, even if you walk into a church and your organization sort of, you know, presents itself and, and nothing happens, right. You still, you still sort of planted, planted a, a seed. You've planted a seed. I kind of hate to say it, <laughs> just ruin it, but you just got to no, keep it It's frustrating, you, right? Because you hear those those phrases that actually have value, and when we've used them in a religious context, right. to, without thinking about what they mean for so long, it actually it feels like as a somebody who uses words, right? I'm a songwriter, and I think about how they're crafted. I get pissed that there are certain words that I can't use right now until I find a way to use them in a way that utterly upsets them so somebody doesn't hear something that they used to hear and hears it the way that I mean it. And, um, but you know, isn't it kind of fun pass. that we get to say fuck now, though? <laughs> fuck. I know everybody says fuck. It's, I've got to find a new expletive. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I love it. Yeah. We what it. else were you saying, Chuck? I'd cut you off. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, you didn't cut me off. That oh, was, thanks. those were the thoughts. Uh, yeah. I mean, you, I, I was just saying that, that all of those little conversations and all those little cultural sort of like nuances, like they make a big difference. And just, just presenting yourself as a human being to somebody. Jennifer, can well, I ask you a couple of stupid questions? Okay. <laughs> so because, just two. Just oh, two. goodness. Uh, okay. All right, here we go. So just <laughs> just because you come from like a culture that, you know, us youth group kids were like taught to obsess over, right? Um, what are some of the, can you think of the weirdest evangelical situation that you've ever found yourself in? Like, did you ever perform on the same stage as Duncan and the Donuts guy or like... <laughs> like Gerbert or anything, it, right? Like a salty conference. Oh, a salty <laughs> conference! I don't even know what that is. He was like, um, he was he a was talking like our... Bible. Well, he was a not even in the Bible. Oh, he was like a our Barney. He was like our Barney. Yeah, he was like a big blue b- b- I, song. I was just exposed to salty like a few years ago. In fact, I think Man, I met. I'm so the... jealous. Wait, he ex- Wait, what did you say? <laughs> he did what? Salty exposed right? his pages. No, I think I just, I, I think not recently. I think I know somebody whose dad was the creator of that. Oh, okay. So, oh, my right. God. Um, yeah, so I didn't even, and they were saying, yeah, my dad did all these kinds of salty things. And I was like, um, I, what are you talking about? Because I keep thinking S-A-L-T-Y. Right, right. Yeah. Like, he's, like he's a little yeah, salty. Yeah, I'm salty now, yeah. but in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I, I didn't quite understand Christian culture, even though I was a part of it. Like, I had, I didn't, because I didn't grow with it, or I didn't have, like, right. the frog in the pot kind of experience. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I jumped into it. I got there and walked into some rooms going, what the hell is yeah. going on in here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would imagine, yeah. It's not normal. The rest mm. of the world doesn't work like this. It does not compute. Um, I had a lot of experiences like that, but I, I think the... Like for me, like I actually, this sounds weird, but the, like the weirdest experiences that I had and one of the most ex- extreme experiences I had was, and that I hated actually, because I, because I was a musician and because I did go around and play for a lot of youth groups and a lot of youth camps and stuff, um, I got to see a lot of, you know, these adults making events at which they were trying to evangelize and get kids to commit to Christ. And I, I think oh, those are some yeah. of the things that mm. I walked into so many, everybody just assumed that I'd be okay with it. Um, yeah. and because I didn't grow up in that culture that, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen like Jesus camp, the movie, oh, right? Like yeah. that was like a couple hours from where we live here. Yeah. 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 And I, and I'd been to, I'd seen like a 20, I'd been to 20 camps where oh, I'd seen things like that. So it's almost normal, right? The people that are doing that, and I'm probably maybe still doing that today, don't really get how gross and awful and terrible and traumatic mm-hmm. yeah, that agreed. is to a young person. Hmm. Um, I, I tell one story about it in my book, um, Facing the Music, where the, I, I think I wrote about it in my book. I don't remember now. I'm pretty sure <laughs> maybe we edited it out. I'm pretty, but I'm pretty sure it's in there, but it was like, yeah, it was like this. They woke up all these kids in the middle of the night and started doing this apocalyptic raid oh and shining my God. Flat, like 
in the dark woods, no. dragging him outside, telling him that like the, the world was ending right then. And I kid you not, like people believed it. And kids were given, you know, they were like, if you don't commit to Christ right now, you're going to die this night. <sighs> Choose to stay who you're going to serve. Whoa. And it was amazing. Their conversion rate was like 95%. Oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I know, right, exactly. Just Hell yeah. Fucking and terrorize like, people, yeah. <laughs> and that was a kind of experience because I didn't grow up in that, because yeah. it, you know, I just, I, because that just seemed so alien to me, utterly terrible and wrong and, and a human, you know, a human rights violation. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I just, I couldn't even imagine that. And everyone around, like everybody that was perpetrating this was looking at me like, join in the fun. This is fun. I'm like, this is not fun. This yeah. is not fun at all. This is criminal. Like, do right. the parents know that you're doing this? Would you do this in front of the parents? Is this, this is not okay. Mm -hmm. These are not valid decisions. These are not informed decisions. This is not a spiritual commitment. This is a save yourself from the apocalypse trauma event. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I saw way too many of those to even, I mean, that was an extreme version of it. But even like after you, after I saw one of those, I, it, I, I just couldn't even tolerate the every eye bowed, you yeah. know, every oh, head bowed, yeah. every altar eyes calls. closed, yeah. altar yep. call where, where a pastor standing up the front and says, you know, raise your hand for commitment to Christ. Sure. Nobody raises their hand and they say, I see that hand. Like, this is bullshit. Like, uh, yeah. You, yeah, yeah. you don't get a life changed by guilting somebody or pressuring somebody in that social situation. Right. And it's not that I have an anti-evangelical thing. Like, I... You know, I want to connect people. I, I would gladly share the good news of the faith that I have, but I not, I, I just, I think that's built in relationships. I'm, that's built in something much more deeply meaningful than just, you know, forcing somebody's hand to join the club today and then mm -hmm. not knowing anything about it. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a long-term story. It's a long-term relationship. Mm -hmm. It's an exploration that should be a, you know, a deeply moving choice um, and not a coercion. And, mm -hmm. you know, so that, yeah, that's just some of, some of the weird things that part of that culture, I was just like, that was one of the things I was just like, I, I can't be a part of this. And the assumption that just because I have a guitar and that I share the same language and faith tradition that I'm in on this, you guys are smoking dope. Like this is, this is not a cool thing. I, if they were, they wouldn't I, be terrorizing children. Yeah, I but you know, at the same dope. <laughs> Yeah, right. But it's a funny thing too, like when you were like me and you you know, my there were many days where my paycheck was leveraged on that, you know. Like if, yeah. if I didn't at least not get in the way, like uh -huh. where was I as a twenty five year old kid right. looking at a forty two year old male pastor exactly. perpetrating this stuff saying, wow. No, I don't want gas money to go home and you should stop and cease and desist doing this right now. I didn't know how to do it. If I saw it today, I'd be like, Nope. We are not doing this, not on my watch. But, you know, yeah, those, those to do, absolutely. things happen and mm. it's not okay. And I think as we grow up and start to tell those stories, I think is the way to get them to stop. God, I was, was I was just thinking maybe like a, really, a cute story about yeah. Gerbert, but that was a hell of a lot better. I was going to say that was a really good answer. It was I really good. I would have said something about like, like worship with flags or something. I would like to say that I got into like you know Bob the tomato, the uh -huh. Bob the tomato that yeah. I wore his costume and it smelled uh, like I did that Teen Spirit or something, but mm. no. I I, but, like, I legitimately me, wore like, a Bob the Tomato like, costume. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. I just want everybody to know that I did wear a Bob the Tomato costume for an event. Um, anyway, go on. Did Did you wear leggings? Um, there were like leggingy things that came with the costume. Yeah. So like riddle me this, like, did your junk get covered by the tomato? <laughs> <laughs> My junk was inside the tomato. I'm pretty sure. It would not be the first time. Hey, you know, I, <laughs> I relate. If you had like a cod piece, that would have made a lot of Christians uncomfortable. <laughs> right, right. You know, uh, Jennifer, uh, I've got a lot a in Merkin. common with Bob the tomato, um, because for the longest time, neither of us realized that we were fruit. Oh, uh, hey. and you know, I found out that uh, cucumbers is also fruit too. Cucumbers right? also a fruit, yeah. Veggie tails is a fucking lie. D Larry also found out that he can be used as a dildo, which I'm sure was an oh. existential. That would, help. That would oh be an existential for him. Yeah, man, we oh, just don't go there. oh, I got so many bad things to say right now. Do it, let them out one by no, one. No, I'm not gonna do it. Burial them off. Tossing salads. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> All right, so we're done. Um, Tossing salads. Chuck, did you have any other questions for Jennifer while we have her? 
Junior Asparagus might be listening, okay? Oh, he's so Innocent cute. Ears. He's so cute. Um, Junior Asparagus never talks about how they make every... Uh, does Junior Asparagus's pee smell like asparagus? Right. <laughs> it's very true. That's, it wow. smells like, it oh, smells like humans. Yeah, it smells like humans. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say this. My favorite my favorite veggie tale, like I wasn't, you know, big on it, but I really did love... I think it was David and Goliath, uh-huh. and we're... we're my James favorite and... thing that I'll never forget is when the, the sheep used to fall over and David used to have to pick him up out on the field. It's my yes. favorite little details moment. That was super cute. I was about to say James and a Giant Pickle, but that's the no, uh, that's, that's the yeah. Ronald Dow book, James and a Giant Peach, Peach them yeah. mixed up anyway. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate that. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess that's it for today. We're going to go ahead and sign off. We have this cute little thing that we end our episodes with. And that is, uh, we uh, say, wait. wait, before you get into that, uh, we do have a Patreon. If you would like to support us, we also have uh, a secret community on Facebook where you can uh, like carefully and thoughtfully deconstruct without being interrupted by uh, indoctrinated relatives or mean, <laughs> mean old friends or... People uh, telling you the world's going to end and you yeah, need to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, f- or fundamentalist doctrine or whatever. Or salty. <laughs> Get him out yeah, of here, man. Yeah, we're, we're salty, but there's no salt. But salty is not a part of the uh, group. Jennifer, Google image search salty when you get a chance. It is <laughs> creepy, and you might need to go back and talk to your friend about his, their uh, Yeah, I'm aware of what that looked like, and I gave that up about Ooh. five minutes after I started. <laughs> <laughs> There are a lot of things I've spent like in the dark on the dark web that um, <laughs> kept my interest a lot longer than salty. Salty terrified me. <laughs> like the Rat King. Oh, don't even start. I'm it. sorry, salty. I'm sorry, salty lovers. <laughs> oh, none of them listen to this show. <laughs> yeah, right. We're, we're, we're eminently yeah, yeah. Salty. I don't think anybody lo- loves salty. I think they're mostly trauma associated with a big mm-hmm. Bible person. But we like to end our episodes by saying, if you don't go to church. Sunday, Sunday is, is just, just a, a second, second Saturday. Saturday. This is the life after. With Brady Harden, Chuck Parson, and our special guest Jennifer Knapp. Hey, Jennifer, wait, let her Thank say her own name. Let her oh, say her own name. <laughs> say your name, <laughs> Jennifer. <laughs> Jennifer. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> That's a wrap. Oh.